What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Lawrence W. Lepard founded Equity Management Associates in 2006. EMA is an equity investment management firm that invests in growing private and public companies located around the world. Since 2008, EMA is focused on investing in companies which mine the monetary metals gold and silver. Larry presently serves on the board of directors of two development stage gold mining companies. He has been a frequent guest of many media outlets, including Bloomberg Television, for his expertise on the monetary metals market. Prior to founding EMA, he spent 13 years at Geo Capital Partners in Fort Lee, New Jersey. There, he was one of two managing general partners, was responsible for four venture capital funds, aggregating $500 million. At Geo, he invested and or served on the boards of many successful deals, including AutoWeb, Jackson Hewitt, Netcom, and Realtor.com. Prior to Geo, Larry spent seven years at Summit Partners in Boston, Massachusetts, and Newport Beach, California, where he established Summit's West Coast office. Larry was a general partner in Summit 1 and Summit 2 and invested and or served on the boards of Chips and Technologies and Software Spectrum, among other investments. Earlier in his career, Larry also worked in the mergers and acquisition group of Smith, Barney, Harris, Upham, and Company. Lawrence Lepard received an undergraduate degree from Colgate University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Larry, welcome back to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast, sir. How are you? Yeah, thank you, Cedric, for having me on. Boy, that's a lot of, a lot of background on me. I... <laughs> It brings back all these old memories. Uh, super good to see. I, I really enjoyed our last conversation. It's been too long. Yeah, of course. You know, so that came out on January 4th, 2023, episode 139. It's just math. Okay. And that remains to this day uh, my number one most downloaded show of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. Good and it, had, it has the biggest afterlife of oh. any episode. Like, say, post 90 days or something. It had the most and, and, and dramatically the most growth. Uh, so it must have just kind of got passed around, word of mouth, yeah. uh, that kind of style. I probably said some pretty outrageous stuff, huh? <laughs> no, I think it was great. And I think people should go back to hear it if they haven't heard it. You know, in, in that one, we got into a lot of that resume. And, you know, um, yeah. you know, I'm sure as things come up or memories come up, I'm sure they'll be applicable. Uh, but I kind of want to get into, you know, the economy now. Yeah. And, you know, the reason I laid all that out is just to kind of give people an, you know, an understanding if they don't already know uh, who you are, where you're coming from. Uh, but what what do you see in the economy right now? What are you looking at? Boy, it's it's a really tricky, messy situation, uh, Cedric. And I, I, you know, I, I wish I had great confidence about what's going to happen. And as time goes by, I've, I've gotten humble enough to know that um, I, I don't really know what's going to happen. To be honest with you, um, I mean, as let me give you an example. You know, the stock market is at record highs. If you had asked me a year or two, two ago, you know, we peaked, as you recall, in December of 2021 and then December of 2022, we went down hard in the market. And I frankly thought that was kind of the end of the cycle and that we were going to now enter a bear market and stocks, which are pretty overvalued then and are once again overvalued now. I thought they were going to correct. And uh, and obviously I was dead ass wrong. <laughs> I mean, they, uh, you know, they're back at record highs and uh I thought the Fed tightening cycle would have much more of an impact on the economy than it's had. Uh, and, and therefore, that's part of why I thought the stock market would go down. Um, I guess the piece that none of us could foresee at the time that's really, I think, shocking to me, and I think is, it explains why the market's up and the economy is as good as it is, is that on the fiscal side, the government's just kind of gone crazy. Um, you know, I, I tweeted about a week ago, there was a very, I think it was on Monday of this week. If you go to my Twitter feed, you'll see a very good article that was in the Wall Street Journal that showed um, how the spending levels and, and the debt refinancing levels are kind of back at and almost above the COVID levels. And so, although monetary policy is tighter, um, you know, interest rates, obviously, when Powell started tightening, they're almost zero. They've gone up to a Fed funds rate of over five which in historical times would have slowed the economy significantly. Um, you know, the economy's kind of hung in there. Now, it's also two economies. I mean, I think the, you know, the, the, the average person is hurting very badly and there's a part of the economy that's really hurting and it's quite sad. Um, but there's a, there are enough people that are, you know, have enough wealth, boomers, others that, you know, and the upper income folks, and they continue to spend. I mean, air traffic has not slowed down. Restaurant traffic has not slowed down. 
um, you know, it's it's kind of held together. Part of this, too, I think, is that, you know, some of these consumers are whistling past the graveyard. I mean, one of the things we've seen is a credit card debt has really taken a spike. And, you know, you can borrow a lot of money and have a nice party. But at some point, the bills come due and uh, the interest rates are higher. And so, you know, I have to say, it feels to me like at some point the economy is going to roll over. We're going to start to see unemployment. We're going to start to see a, a, a tougher condition. But honestly, I've thought that for a couple of years now and it hasn't happened. So I'm beginning to doubt myself. <laughs> and it, it, it's really, you know, um, macro is tough. Uh, there are so many moving pieces. And, um, you know, as it turns out, I think one of the other things we've learned is that 5% wasn't high enough or 5% interest rates are not enough to calm down the speculative fever. I mean, if I think if, if Powell really wanted to be a Volcker, he would have to take rates higher. Um, you know, we've seen inflation come down from the nine prints that we had maybe a year ago, year and a half ago to kind of the three prints, but we're not at two yet. And, you know, the, the Fed is doing its typical dance where they're playing good cop, bad cop. You know, they're saying, well, you know, we, uh, we're going to tighten until we get to 2%. That's bad cop. And good cop is, yeah, but we're getting to 2% and everything looks good. Enough. So we're probably at the peak of the cycle and you can expect cuts in the future. So they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. Um, and as they always do. And to be frank with you, it's, it's very hard to know how it's all going to sort itself out. Let me tell you one piece of signal that I think is extremely important, though, um, that I that I look at, and it's it's probably I'm going to write my quarterly report, and quarter just ended today, um, and and that piece of signal is that gold is at record highs and Bitcoin is at record highs, and these are the two sound money alternatives. I, as you know, I think Bitcoin superior, but gold plays a big and important role. It's much a larger market, and you know, eight eight billion people know what gold is, and the number of people who know what Bitcoin is, is smaller or we've accepted it or is smaller. And um, they're both at a record high. And so to me, what that is, is that's the market saying to us, hey, we think that even though the Fed hasn't pivoted and they're not printing money aggressively right now, we think it's inevitable they're going to have to. And I share that sentiment. I think that, you know, the, the Fed is trapped. Um, I don't know what their moves will be. I don't know if they will wait for something to break and then flood the system with money. <laughs> um, we've seen, you know, in 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 the fall of last year, interest rates backed up. The ten year got over five percent, and that immediately led to ten or fifteen Fed governors saying, "Oh no, 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 the, the right hack cycle's over. You know, we're gonna we're gonna start cutting soon." And of course, the bond market front ran that, and everything got back under control. Uh, we saw in the most recent Powell Press uh, conference a few a few days ago or a week ago, I guess now, uh, and he said, well, the quantitative tightening, we might start to reduce that um, because they can see that maybe conditions will get too tight. And he even alluded to the fact that he didn't want to have another repo spike like he had in 2019. So, um, you know, it's at a macro level, I see a lot of cross currents and I just don't honestly know what's going to happen in the shorter term. What I believe in the longer term, though, and this is what's important for an investment thesis, because I've never really invested with a, I, I need to make money in a month or three months or six months or even a year. You know, I've, I've been kind of a long term thematic investor where I try and get the big picture macro right. And then within that, find the best assets or companies or ideas to invest in. And in the longer term, I think we we can, I feel quite confident that, you know, the, the system as it is cannot continue to grow the debt levels at rates in excess of the GDP growth. I mean, Biden recently came out with his budget for 2025, and he grew it to 7.3 trillion, which is a 12% growth rate year over year, right? And, you know, I can assure you the GDP is not growing at 12%. And the GDP is, this is my lead chart on my Twitter feed, you know, if, if the debt level is growing faster than the GDP level, you can do that for a while and you can have a party with debt, but at some point the chickens come home to roost. And so I strongly believe that, you know, you know, one to three year window, probably closer to one, but that, you know, something will break and the Fed will have to go back to monetary accommodation, you know, QE, uh, low interest rates, you know, all the things that got us the inflation that we had before, you know, maybe fiscal stimulus, maybe more stimmy checks, who knows? Um, I think those things are coming, but obviously right now, you know, because we have these cycles up and down, 
you know, they perceived inflation to be a bigger risk. And so they fought it. Um, you know, my guess is what they'll try to do is probably declare victory before they get to 2%. And that, you know, won't be true. And, and maybe they'll redefine the acceptable inflation rate as 3%. And, you know, the minute they do that, risk assets are going to take off again and, and the money supply, you know, M2 is going to start to grow and the money supply is going to grow and we're going to be back into that inflationary environment. So, you know, big picture, I think I've said this in other podcasts, I'll say it to you, we haven't talked for a while. You know, this feels to me like the 70s. I think we had, I think we had a peak deflationary moment in March of 2020. And I think at that point in time, things turned. And of course, inflation got started and then it really accelerated with all the COVID, you know, activities. And, um, and of course, you know, that's what took us up to the nine print on the headline CPI. Uh, and then they responded with higher interest rates and that's brought it back down. But my friend Tavi Costa has a great chart that he puts up on Twitter regularly that kind of shows how inflation developed in the seventies. And there were waves, you know, it would go up higher and then it would back off and then they'd loosen again. It would go higher still and it would back off. And I, I think that's the environment we're in. I think we've turned into an inflationary environment. And there are a lot of reasons for that. You can see we haven't invested enough in commodities. We haven't invested enough in CapEx. Labor is starting to push very hard for higher wage prices. You're seeing lots of people who are getting 5 to 10% raises. And you can't have that happening without, you know, I mean, they're, they're aiming for 2% inflation. And if workers are getting 6 or 7% raises, that's not, that's more than 2%. So, so again, I, I feel very confident in my thesis that we will have more monetary debasement and that that will help the sound money assets, which I define as things the government can't print. <laughs> you know, Bitcoin being number one, gold being number two, and real estate being number three. So I, I think they're all areas that will outperform in the decade ahead. So kind of a long-winded answer, but it gives you kind of a big picture of how I see the world right now. Yeah, I mean, I really appreciate the way you see the world. I kind of feel aligned. Yeah. I wonder, though, you know, and this is kind of my question, but, you know, because you talked about stock market and house prices and the Fed tightening. And I would have thought, you know, even house prices, I mean, I, I see them as almost Forex above where they were mm -hmm. before a lot of this because they've gone up 50 to 100 percent and the rates yeah. have doubled. Right. So almost tripled, you know, and yeah. but are, does that make us? Are we just doomers? You know, because the other side is this all melts up and and, and or uh, 2008 was similar to 2020 and or 2020 was like 2008. And we were, you know, three ways, three years into another 15 years of them kicking the can down the road and maybe managing Possibly, this four or five percent yeah. inflation. I, I hate the, I hate the doom doomer because I I'm a very optimistic person about the world, right. the world and where we're going. I do think things are going to get better. Um, but I can't look at the facts in, in the world and the, fa the fact pattern and not, you know, draw mm -hmm. conclusions based on the fact pattern. I think what you allude to is a good point, which is to say we might actually have a pretty healthy economy. We might actually have reasonably full employment. We might actually have a healthy stock market. Um, you know, all the infrastructure spending and all the all the money that's been poured into the system is kind of making the economy do OK. Um, I, I, I can accept all that. I think that's one of the possible outcomes. What I can't accept is that you're going to have that happen and have low inflation at the same point in time. I think that, you know, if if we get what you described, which is we don't have a stock market downturn and we don't have a, an economic downturn, I think that the inflation that, you know, they've kind of tamed as a result of the increase in interest rates, I think it will come back. Um, that we haven't fully tamed it, and we're not going back to the deflationary world that we lived in from you know 1980 to 2000, March of 2020. And so it seems to me like, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe the way this whole cycle manifests itself is we actually get decent economic growth, you know, decent economy, low unemployment, but boy, inflation just continues to eat away at us. You know, gasoline prices keep getting higher, home prices keep getting higher, food prices keep getting higher, you know, to the point where at some point people are really going to squawk. And, you know, what's the Fed going to do? I mean, you know, are they going to, I mean, if, you know, the what we've seen, I mean, this is the piece that we haven't really talked about yet, but, you know, the U.S. fiscal situation is a real mess. I mean, we are running a $2 trillion annualized deficit in a healthy economy. I mean, that's the kind of deficit we ran in 2008. You know, we ran a slightly bigger one at the COVID event, but 
here we are running an enormous deficit and when theoretically everything is okay. Imagine if we really had an economic downturn, the deficit would get larger. And the implication of that deficit with higher interest rates, the other chart that just scares the living Jesus out of me is, and it's easy to pull up, we don't have it right here, but it's easy to pull up, it's just the chart of the US federal interest expense. You know, the the I mean, we've got 34 trillion of debt outstanding. And I mean, here's another fun fact, right? We added a trillion dollars in a hundred days to the US national debt, right? And you know, 365 days in a year, same run rate. So we're going to add 3.65 trillion a year to the debt. I mean, and the deficit now, I, I don't think the deficit fully reflects all the borrowing that we do, but the deficit is clearly running at two trillion, maybe two and a half. And so you know, as we increase the level of that debt and the cost on that debt goes up, recall that, you know, before COVID, before all these things went, you know, before we raised interest rates, the government was paying $300 million, $300 billion a year to service the debt. Well, guess what? You take interest rates from 50 basis points to 500 basis points. And the debt service I read today is now over $1.1 trillion per year. And that's with an average interest rate on that debt of about 3%. And if you go look at the treasury curve, most of the treasuries are, are yielding 5%. So as the older, cheaper debt comes off, the new refinanced debt is going to cost even more. So I could see where we're going to have $1.5 trillion in interest costs. I mean, um, and, and, and that makes the deficit larger, which makes the borrowings larger. And I mean, you see where I'm going here, which is to say that, um, you know, who's going to buy that debt? And certainly... You can find buyers for that debt, but they're going to require a higher interest rate. And if the interest rate gets higher and the debt balance gets bigger, the deficit gets bigger. And you see where I'm going. It's it's a doom loop. It's a it's an increasingly an increasingly large deficit that can't be funded out of tax revenue. And the only two solutions to this, and of course, um, you know the the, uh, the odds of them being pursued are quite low, would be to cut spending or increase taxes. And, you know, we, we see none of that going on in D.C. I mean, they just passed a, I think it was a $1.2 trillion spending bill. It was thousands of pages that they had 48 hours to read. You know, I mean, they're just, they're, they're spending like drunken sailors and there's, you don't see any fiscal restraint. Um, and, and so, um, you know, and, and the fiscal drives the monetary. I mean, right now the monetary is tight, but. As we know, the Federal Reserve has three mandates, uh, full employment, low inflation, and, and the third unspoken mandate is keep the system running and, you know, and, and whatever it takes. And, um, you know, the, the, that third one is going to could come into play here at some point. Right. When if the U.S. bond market starts to sell off severely, interest rates start to go up rapidly, you know, kind of the way it did with the guilt crisis in the U.K., you know, a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, at that point in time you know, Powell would instantly reverse all his policies. I mean, he would have to take rates down. He would have to stop QT. He would have to resume QE. And he would have to more or less print money. I mean, grow the monetary base to service the debt. Um, and I think that's what Bitcoin and gold are smelling. And that's why, you know, Bitcoin is bumping up against record highs and gold is pushing deep into record highs. The, the peak on the gold market was kind of in the 2070, 2080 area. And I think it closed today over 2,200, and it seems to be just kind of on fire. And uh, you know, these these two assets are the the best mon the best indicators of of the monetary, you know, of, of trust in the monetary system. And when people are buying these assets, it's because they don't trust the value of the dollar. So, so you know, you mentioned your quarterly report that you you yeah. know we just finished the quarter, and you'll be getting to that. Yeah, I got to imagine, you know, coming zooming up to this year, because we can come back to the economy and, and some other things that I want to get into. Sure. But, you know, looking at the first quarter, I mean, I would think that the Bitcoin ETF would would play a big role yeah. in this report. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I want to ask you about the Bitcoin ETF. Um, what has been your impression so far? Yeah, great question. I mean, boy, wh what a fabulous thing, right? I mean, I think the three judges in Delaware who ruled in favor of GBTC and therefore pushed Gary Gensler into doing what he didn't want to do, which was to approve the Bitcoin ETF. Those guys are going to be heroes or they should be heroes when monetary history is written. 
um, you know, the, the Bitcoin ETF is, is just an enormous thing. And, you know, I'm not the first one to say, say this. I mean, I think sailors probably said it more loudly and better than any of us could have, which is to say that, you know, pre the Bitcoin ETF, the world, you know, and, and I know this because I was talking to a lot of big institutional investors. The world was looking at Bitcoin and saying, well, that's interesting. Uh, digital gold. Yeah, I kind of get that. Boy, that could really mess up the dollar. That, that, you know, boy, that's not in the government's best interest, is it? And, and the, the biggest piece of FUD I was always encountering was, you know, if that thing works, the government's going to shut it down. There's just no way they're going to let this thing live because it's a threat to the dollars, a threat to their system. It's a threat to everything. And suddenly, you know, that piece of FUD just disappeared because the government literally approved a Bitcoin ETF and said to everybody, yeah, you can invest in this thing. We think it's a commodity. We think it's legit. You can invest in it and have at it. That's enormous, absolutely enormous in terms of taking away the fear that a lot of traditional finance had that the government would ultimately shut it down. So, so once that occurred, um, you, you just unlock the door. I mean, it's kind of similar to what happened when the gold ETF came out before. This is history now. Back in 04, gold was trading at two or three hundred dollars an ounce. And if you wanted to buy gold, you had to go to a coin store or to a bullion dealer and you could buy coins. Well, guess what? The average person wasn't going to do that, right? They're not going to go buy gold coins. I mean, but the gold ETF got approved in 04 and suddenly you know, they could call up their broker and say, hey, you know what? I want to have a little bit of gold as a diversifier. And, you know, the broker said, fine, I'll buy some GLD for you. And they did. And, you know, interestingly, after that ETF was approved, gold went from $250, $300 an ounce to $1,900 an ounce in a kind of in a five or six year window. So it's seven X, right? And that's just the ability that, that, that unlocking all that Wall Street money and its ability to buy gold. That's what it did to the price of gold. I'm not saying the exact same thing is going to happen with respect to Bitcoin, but the pattern is similar, right? We know that there is, you know, $40 trillion roughly of RIA capital out there. We know that there are all kinds of brokerage accounts that until the ETF really couldn't buy any form of Bitcoin. They could buy GBTC, but, you know, it was a closed end fund that sold at a discount and had a high fee. And, you know, or they could buy MicroStrategy, which was a nice proxy for Bitcoin. And that was some of the smart ones did that. But the average person, you know, if they had decided, hey, you know what? I, hey, broker, I've got some money in my account. I want to buy some Bitcoin. The broker was like, sorry, I can't do it. You know, he wasn't going to go get a Trezor or a Ledger or, you know, a cold card and, cold, you know, cold store some coin for you. But now he can do it. I mean, in some cases, I interestingly, I've had clients, two clients, one at Morgan Stanley and one at Edward D. Jones, both of them said they wouldn't let them buy it which I thought was shocking. I mean, that, that'll have to change because ultimately those companies are going to say, hey, I mean, the, the clients are going to say, well, I'm going to leave if you won't let me buy it. And those companies are going to change their view. But um, but anyway, you know, this has just opened a river of money. And, and it, you know, we've seen, I mean, I, I, you know, Sailor said it would be important. I believed it would be important. It's been even more important than I expected. I mean, the amount that's come, this is the fastest growth of an ETF, a group of ETFs ever in the history of, of, you know, introducing new ETFs. And so they've very rapidly gone from nothing to multiple billions. I don't know the exact number right now. You may, but it's a big number and it's consistent and it's growing. And, you know, Wall Street's slow. I mean, this is, like I said, Morgan Stanley and Edward Jones aren't even letting their people buy it yet. That'll change. Um, you know, a lot of people, I'm sure, a lot of these big firms are looking at it, but they've got to do their work and study it. And, you know, this is, we're, we're just talking about the first adopters right now. And, you know, what have they do, they've done? They've taken, I don't know, the day it was announced, you know, the price, I mean, I think it was in the 30s, maybe the low 40s, you know, so they, you know, it was, it was somewhere in that rough area. And you know, here we are with 70, right? So, I mean, it's, what are we, a couple months in? I mean, it's not that deeply into it. I mean, that's quite a move. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and so if that demand just stays there, which I believe it will, um, you know, I, I fully expect that, you know, we'll be at 100, 120, 150, perhaps by year end. You know, and I could be wrong. I mean, price projections are really just guesses, but, um, you know, the the trend would appear to support, from my point of view, the trend would appear to support, you know, higher prices here as, as these ETFs get more widely adopted. So to me, it's an enormously positive thing on, at two levels. One, the government said, we're not going to kill this thing, at least not today. And so people can no longer use that excuse for not buying it. And two, it allowed a bunch of money that could not logically buy the stuff to now buy it. And so, 
you know, and, and, and then when you think about how Wall Street operates, I was talking with somebody else about this today, you know, Wall Street's all about relative performance. I mean, you know, brokers are, you know, brokers live on how well do we do this year? Are we up? Are we down? Did we, you know, what do the, what do the indices do? What did my account do, broker? Gosh, the indices are up 10%. Why was I only up six? What, what are you doing? You know, well, okay, fine. Look back historically. I mean, Bitcoin has been the best performing financial asset in the history of the world ever. You know, and so, you know, here we go. I mean, um, you know, and and so so brokers are going to be put into a position where it's like if they don't put their clients into it, and other brokers do put their clients into it, they're going to underperform. And there's nothing that a Wall Street broker fears more than having his clients underperform an average or index or what the other people are doing. And so, you know, as they see how well this thing is performing, they're going to, you know, they're going to come at it, in my opinion. So I I, I couldn't be more excited about where we are right now. And I, I'm just, I'm so pleased that the ETF got approved. I mean, I, I actually was very concerned that it somehow it would not get approved that they would figure out a way to not approve it. And it's interesting to me, I think another big piece of it, why it did get approved was that BlackRock, one of the biggest Wall Street firms with a lot of political clout, a lot of money and a lot of influence, the fact that Larry Fink flipped on it and went positive on it and realized, you know what? I can make more money selling this ETF than I can bitching about Bitcoin. Um, I think that was I think that was what really turned, that helped turn the, the corner as well. And so, so here we are. And you know, in, in my view, we're still early days. And I know a lot of people look at 70,000 and say, oh, God, I missed it. Well, on a risk adjusted basis, I really don't think you did. You know, I think it was harder to buy at 15,000 when there was a lot of more uncertainty a few years back. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that we now know the government's not going to oppose it um, removes a lot of uncertainty. The fact that we now know that all this money can come chase it, you know, that's that's a huge positive. And and then the final point I would make on this topic is just the size of it all and the relative size of it all. So, um, you know, the Bitcoin total market cap today is about $1.4 trillion. That's the 19.7 coins outstanding times 70,000, roughly, whatever it is. First of all, we know that not all those 19 are really exist, that some of those got lost in the early days. So, so maybe it's, you know, 18 or 17. We don't know what the percentage is, but it's not all 19 are there. Second of all, a lot of those are in really strong hands that aren't going to sell. So, you know, I mean, not unless prices are much higher. So, so you've got $1.4 trillion market cap is, is total value of all the Bitcoin in existence today. You've got in, in, in the total U.S. bond market today is roughly $150 trillion. The total U.S. stock market today is something like $120 trillion. And currency is outstanding. Another 30, so call it $300 trillion of you know, traditional financial assets, stocks, bonds, and cash, right? So that 300 trillion, trillion with a T of traditional assets, some of it is going to say, you know, this Bitcoin is performing better than my bonds. It's performing better than my stocks. It's performing better than my gold, whatever. I should have some of that. And not, not all 300 trillion is going to chase Bitcoin. Of course not. But, you know, could 1%, you know, that's 3 trillion. You know, could 10%, that's 30 trillion. I mean, even if only 1% said, you know, at the margin, I think Bitcoin's going to beat this other stuff, that would be $3 trillion chasing a $1.4 trillion market, all of which is not for sale. So, I mean, you could easily double, triple, quadruple the value of today's coins per coin, right? So, I, I, I mean, I'd see, you know, I mean, just to get to the gold market cap for comparison is about one or $12 trillion. And that's a little funny because... Um, the gold market cap includes all the gold that's in museums and all the gold that's on women's necks in India and China and the United States. And, you know, I mean, look, gold gets to $200,000 an ounce. Everyone's going to be selling their gold jewelry. Mm -hmm. But but in general, the tradable gold is about $4 trillion, you know, the amount. And there's about $3 trillion that's in central bank balance sheets. Tradable gold, bullion and coins, about $4 trillion. So Bitcoin's $1.4. Tradable gold's about $4 trillion. And, you know, we've got this 300 trillion of other kinds of money that some of which is going to say, you know, this government stuff's out of control. And I think they're really going to print a lot more. I need to find something the government's not going to print. I'm going to buy some gold or I'm going to buy some Bitcoin. And I think more of the young people are going to go for the Bitcoin because it's, it's got it's more aggressive and it's going to be 
higher upside than gold. The older people tend to go for gold because it's less volatile. But, you know, those younger people, um, as they come chasing it, you know, are, they're just going to push the price much higher. So, um, uh, you know, I'm I'm just incredibly bullish. And, you know, we can we can go to what the end point and the end game is, if you like, as well. I talked about that in Madeira. But, um, you know, I'm bullish short term and I'm also very bullish long term. I mean, the only caution I offer is just that, as you know, as I know, and as every hodler knows, you know, this is a volatile thing. And you always have to be prepared that it could go down. And that's that that doesn't that's not fun. But if you don't need the money and you have a long term perspective and you believe in the thesis, you know, the only way you get hurt is if you sell when it goes down. If you just sit there and ride it out, you know, every time it comes back and it tends to make higher highs and higher lows. So I don't know. Does that <laughs> I got off track there a little bit? Oh, that was awesome. That was great. <laughs> and so there's a lot I want to unpack there. I guess yeah, the first question will be, do you think retail comes back? Because uh, my impression right now is that all of this move from 30 to 70K or 15 to 70K ETF driven, whatever it's dri whatever's driving it, I don't think has been retail. I think maybe they've been uh, scared from FTX and Celsius and Mt. Gox and three uh, ups and downs that they've seen recently. The big, uh, do you think they're coming back or do you think they I are do. back? I, I don't. Yeah, it's hard to tell where all this is coming from. I mean, I think I think you've got kind of sophisticated retail, you know, high net worth and, you know, wealthy families and, and even maybe some of the, you know, some sovereign governments. I mean, El Salvador is the only announced one, but I honestly think that you know, some of the Arab states and perhaps Russia. And, and I mean, there are other large entities, in my opinion, that are in there buying and acquiring this stuff. They get it. They know what it is and they're buying it. Um, but yes, you're right. I mean, FTX was a shock to the system. I still, when I talk to a lot of people about it, you know, they dismiss it based on that. They, they think that Bitcoin is crypto. You know, it's not. I know it's not. It's a technological innovation. It's proof of work. It's distributed. I mean, it's everything that crypto isn't. But sadly, crypto, you know, put a lot of people off, off, you know, off balance and scared a lot of people away from it because they didn't take the time to differentiate between all these crypto things, which are bullshit and these scam artists like, you know, Novogratz, you know, and, and SBF and, you know, I mean, there are a ton of them um, and, and, you know, the true Bitcoin code. I mean. Bitcoin is, as you know, a technical innovation. It's a it's a discovery or an innovation, you know, that I think is kind of a parallel to a I don't know inventing the printing press or inventing the internet or inventing a cell phone or inventing an airplane. I mean, whatever it might be, however you want to describe it, the people who invented Bitcoin made something unique, which is did they created digital scarcity. And as, as I've said in other podcasts, when I first got into it, I didn't believe in it because, frankly, they had tried before. I'll give you a list of some of the names. I mean, David Chalm started off in 83. They had eCash, DigiCash, eGold, BitGold, B-Money, and HashCash. Those were all failed attempts in the 80s and 90s at creating digital money. And every one of them failed because what happened is, you know, they couldn't control the double spend problem. They, they didn't solve for the you know, the Byzantine generals issue. They didn't have, you know, the hashing. They didn't have the difficulty adjustment. They didn't have the proof of work. They didn't have the blockchain, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, but by the way, each of those efforts uncovered in some cases, a part of the problem. Do you know what I mean? Adam Back, who is still with us, you know, figured out a piece of the problem that got used in the Bitcoin white paper. And he's, he's referenced in the white paper. So, um, these guys all eventually created digital scarcity. By giving us digital scarcity, what they gave us was a commodity, 21 million, you know, fixed at 21 million, or ultimately it'll get there, um, that does not respond to price, and which is just shocking. I mean, this is like, we've never, ever seen one of these. And that's why it's so hard to understand this thing. That's why it's so hard to model the price. As, as you know, as I know, as any economic person, actor knows, if the price of something goes up, the supply will increase. I can assure you, if the price of gold doubles tomorrow, we will open more gold mines. <laughs> you know, if the price of oil doubles, we'll be drilling for more oil. The price of corn doubles, the farmers will be planting more corn. And um, you know, at the margin, a higher price leads to greater supply. This is one of those, this is a good 
where a higher price does not lead to greater supply. That's important. That's unique. We've never had anything like that before. Remember that, never. So that, that to me is why this thing has outperformed every other financial asset that's ever existed because we've never had a financial asset with a fixed supply. And so, um, you know, you've got to kind of get your head around that to understand why this is such a big change and why it's so important and why it's so meaningful. And, you know, it, it reminds me, I mean, I recall when the internet first came out, I was a technology investor. I was in the venture capital business and you know, it kind of reminds me of that. A lot of people are very skeptical. Who cares? How's it going to work? You can't touch it. You can't feel it. It's a bunch of servers. You know, yeah, I know it's a protocol, but what is SMT, SMTP? I mean, you know, TCP IP. Yeah, I don't get it. And there's a lot of skepticism about it. And yet you could see what it allowed you to do. And I was investing in it thinking, boy, this is going to change the world. This is definitely going to change the world. You go back another generation before that. I was, in, I think, talked about this in Madeira. You know, I invested in Microsoft. And I, I remember a, a friend of mine was roommates with Steve Ballmer at Harvard College. So I met Ballmer. And Ballmer said, Larry, this thing's unbelievable. We've got the base layer of the software that's going to be on every computer in every home. And everyone's going to have more than one computer. This is 1983. And I'm like, first of all, I'm like, you know, you know, I thought he was nuts. I was like, what do you mean everyone's going to have a computer? You know, they're expensive. The IBM PC had just came out. It was very expensive. It was like $2,000, which in 83 was a lot of money. And this was before the cheap clones came around and all that. And really, it had one use. It was word processing. It was kind of a, it was a, it was a nice IBM Selectric, you know, with that you could word process on. And eventually, it had two uses. Mitch Kapoor came over and he demoed one, two, three, and showed us a spreadsheet. And so those were the two first use cases on a PC. And Bummer said, everyone's going to need one of these, and we've got the piece of software that's going to allow it. This is going to be a multi-billion-dollar company. I was like, this guy's nuts, you know, <laughs> he's absolutely nuts. And yet, and I bought it at the IPO, and it went up forty-seven hundred times. From that IPO price. And of course, I sold it three years later to buy a counter, which is a big mistake. But but the point I'm trying to make is that they had a piece, they had a technical innovation that was at the base layer of something that was growing very, very rapidly. And that's kind of the analog here. This is a technical innovation surrounding money. It's a form of money that's programmatic, that can't be printed, that can't be debased by the government. And it, it's unique. And therefore, um, you know, um, there is no substitute. It's it's the leading network by far. It's it's winning on the Metcalf law basis. It's winning on hash. It's winning on all kinds of things. But as a result of that, in my opinion, ultimately everybody's going to need it. And ultimately, you know, we're going to denominate things in sats. And people are going to say, well, that house costs this many sats, and that car costs this many sats, and a gallon of gas is this many sats. And it it will become the base layer of money. Now, that might be twenty five years from now. You know, I mean, I, I you know. Recall that Microsoft and Ballmer telling me, you know, that this was going to be important. It's going to be in every house. It's going to be a billion dollar company. That's 1983. It was 40 years ago. Okay. So, you know, we're not talking about tomorrow. Okay. But I'm talking about, you know, can you, you know, try to, you know, have a little imagination, try to extrapolate the trend here. You know what I mean? And the same is true. I mean, Amazon, Amazon came out. It was a leading network for selling stuff online. All they were selling with books. Okay but they migrated from books into the next category and then the next category and then the next category. And, you know, now you can see where they are, you know, they're, they're online Walmart. Right. And so, you know, this is the same thing. This is a network that is based at the base layer of money that, you know, is, is working and growing. And as we all know, users are going up, hash rates going up. I mean, I've always said the only two things about Bitcoin that concern me are technical failure which I think was a much higher risk in 2013 than it is today. Um, you know, I've, I've gotten quite comfortable with odds of technical failure quite low and, um, and, and loss of interest and, and lack of adoption. I mean, I think if any, if ever, you know, addresses started going down or hash started going down in a, con in a continual way, or everyone just kind of said, ah, you know what, this Bitcoin thing, you know, I'm not interested anymore, then that would be bad. Um, but, you know, if you look at it and there are lots of metrics you can look at, you know, the number of addresses, the amount of hash, the, all, the number of transactions, all of it, it's all growing consistently. The adoption is growing. And so I'm I'm hard pressed to figure out what's going to change that. And so, you know, to me, you know, we're kind of at the stage. I mean, you, cell phones came out in 83. They were expensive, clunky. It was 50 cents a minute. You know, here we are 40 years later. Everyone's got one. And for 20 bucks, you can make unlimited calls worldwide. 
um, you know, same model, right? I mean, this is hard to use, you know, self-custody is not simple. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, I remember dialing up, you know, on the internet and you know, dial up modem, you put it into a, you put your phone into a modem case and, you know, beep, 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 beep. And, you know, it started off at 1200 and then it went to 9,600. Then it went to 14.4 and eventually we got broadband and, you know, same story here, right? I mean, we need a lot better. We need lightning. We need better custody solutions. We need fediment. We need all kinds of innovation. We need to make it so easy that my 80 some odd year old mother can use it. And of course today she couldn't, she just can't understand. She could never self custody, but but that'll come, it'll all come with time. And, you know, it'll be just as, as common as, as you can imagine. And, you know, my kids in their twenties and 20 and 30 year olds, they totally get it, you know? So it, it's, it, it definitely is the future of money as, as I see it. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we bring up sort of uh, Wall Street and the ETFs. The ETFs are a very powerful uh, vehicle delivery system for demand. Yeah, right. And, uh, you know, I'm financially minded economics, uh, right. my background. Uh, I love sort of thinking, sort of economizing. Wall Street sort of is a is a, is a mixed bag. I, I think of it as the good and the, well, the good news <laughs> and the bad news. So I'm going to go with the bad news first. Okay. You know, but like, because I think what... The financial financialization of Bitcoin can be very exciting, and and right. we'll get to what I think some of the exciting parts. But the worrisome part, or it's a Bitcoin, you think adversarially, and even before right. Bitcoin, I mean, you think you should just period think adversarially oh, yeah. for Absolutely. yourself, right? And right. so with the ETFs through Bitcoin, I mean, there's a lot of positive. We noted some of them before attributes, but what do you think about in terms of self custody? And, yeah. uh, you know, because you know we can weaponize some of these things against Wall Street, and Wall Street can help us deal with central bankers right but there's also the financialization of a lot of people's lives where wall street takes up 30 percent of people's time and money and uh the economy and you know there's the blood sucking goldman sachs so you know is oh, this yeah. you know what do you think of sort of the yeah, financialization no, look, look, of Bitcoin? wall street is wall street and historically <laughs> wall street has not been a friend to the american public right i mean what you're what you're describing you know because they've lived off of the privilege that they've had you know, with being able to control fiat, being able to control the Fed. And, you know, they had a heads we win, tails you lose kind of game going where 2008 was the perfect example. You know, they, they let everybody, they, they encouraged everybody to get highly levered. They raked off huge fees and profits. You know, when the when it came time to pay the tab and they all should have been bankrupt, they went to the government and said, bail us out. And, you know, two years later, they were doing the same damn thing. So, so I've got no love of Wall Street. I, I think you know that. Anyone who's listened to my podcast and watches me on Twitter knows that. Um, and so, so yes, there's a mixed, there's a mixed, you know, there's a, this is a double-edged sword, these ETFs, right? I mean, there are some who are quite conspiratorial, and I don't entirely disagree with this, who suggest that, well, Wall Street just, and, and the government to say, well, okay, this Bitcoin thing's going to work. So we might as well get this in the tent rather than out of the tent. You know, before we were all out of the tent, self custodying Nobody knew what we have. All the, all the addresses are, you know, are, are anonymous. And you know, um, as they, they were saying, we were tax cheats because you didn't have to necessarily tell them what you had and report sales. And of course, if you went through brokers in the U.S., you, you did. But the point is that before Wall Street, they didn't have as much knowledge or control of who owned the coins and what they were doing with them. Um, you bring the ETFs in, and suddenly it's all within their ring fence. Okay. So you now, you know, you buy it, you, you buy an ETF at your brokerage firm. They know you bought it. They know you hold it. They know when you sell it. They know how much tax that you own, et cetera, et cetera. And if they ever should decide they want to do a 6102, and for those who aren't familiar with it, 6102 is the executive order that FDR used in 1933 to grab all the gold uh, when he was trying to reset the monetary system back then. Um, you know, these ETFs are extremely convenient for them, right? They will know exactly where the Bitcoin is. And, you know, if, 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 let's say, I mean, here's a, here's a scenario. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but I'm, you know, let's, let's game theory this out a little bit. You know, we're three, four, five years down the road. Bitcoin's at 700,000, 700,000 a coin going to a million five. You know, the dollar has continued to slide. Inflation is very high. People in Washington, D.C. are saying to themselves, hey, this Bitcoin thing is really killing the dollar and ruining our monetary system. We got to rein this damn thing in. I mean, this is this is bad. You know, the dollar is going to fail if Bitcoin goes to three million. Um, you know, maybe we need to tax Bitcoin at eighty percent. Maybe we need to make Bitcoin illegal for a while. Maybe we need to grab all the Bitcoin. Well, 
it's going to be extremely easy for them to do that if you own an ETF in a brokerage firm because they'll just call up the brokerage firm and I can assure you that, you know, Charles Schwab and Morgan Stanley aren't going to disobey the government. <laughs> They're going to completely comply. Yep. You know, we're going to cash out Mr. Lepard. We're going to give him his dollars for his coins. We're going to, you know, um, say, sorry, this is a cashed out price and you no longer own those coins. Here are your dollars at today's price. Of course, this is just before they reset it. As you recall, back in the 30s, when Roosevelt did it, he took all the gold. And then, of course, he, he devalued the dollar against gold. So he immediately stole from everybody, really, effectively. And, you know, who's to say the government won't do the same thing? It's certainly one of the possible scenarios as we go forward. This is why those of us who are in it deeply and are, are hodlers and are long-term hodlers are deeply concerned. Um, we, you know, I, I look, I own some of the ETFs. Why? Because I have some Wall Street-based brokerage accounts that I can't change or move that, you know, um, and they're either IRAs. I don't want to withdraw from them. And as a result, and I, I don't want to go through the, the, the difficulty of making them self-directed. And as a result, you know, it's simplest for me just to buy an ETF and hold my Bitcoin in that ETF account. Fine. That's a small piece of what I hold. For the for the Bitcoin that I, the bigger piece of the Bitcoin that I own, you know, I, I self-custody it, right? I have it on a cold wallet. I have my words. You know, it's um, it's it's not something they know that I have. They could track it because they could see where I bought it and see the transfers. But I can say, hey, I don't have it anymore. I've sold it. I had a boating accident, whatever it might be. And probably more importantly, if they were ever to decide, hey, American citizen, you got to turn in all your Bitcoin and these coins are now worth X million dollars per coin. You know, I could kind of look at them and say, you know, I'm not so sure I'm an American citizen anymore. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm going to learn Italian because uh, I like the food. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, um, I know you'd like to tax these things, but um, how are you going to do that? Because you don't really know my addresses and you don't have the keys to control them and, and so on and so forth. So so there's an argument, you know, that it's in the same way that gold was a bearer instrument. And in 31, 33, they said, turn it in. I'm pretty sure my grandfather had some and didn't. And I'm pretty sure, quite frankly, a lot of America had some and didn't. Um, you know, they it, it's not going to be easy for them to necessarily grab it. So I'm not sure if that was where you're going with your no, question, no. but I think it's, a, it's, it's an interesting thing to consider, right? It's a It's a... It's one of those scenarios that you have to have in the back of your mind. And it's why as people get further and further into it, I try to suggest to them that they have some that is in their own control outside of the financial system. Yeah, for sure. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, I think, you know, there's uh, new solutions all the time, I think, including collaborative custody, which we do with the Bitcoin advisor. Right. Uh, great ways to go. And. But, you know, uh, along these lines, though, I think the the good side or what I'm trying to see is the, the 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 positive attributes here and where this could go also. And I wanted to take your get your opinion on this is with with Tether and stable coins and treasuries, because yeah. I think that's a way sort of uh, to get the world to buy treasuries. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with the Bitcoin ETFs, you could sort of make the argument that they're getting Bitcoin into every American's hands via their 401k somehow. Right. And sort of that great sort of uh, onboarding where the world went from, say, competing between silver and gold and some nations went to gold uh, versus others went to stayed on silver longer and how, you know, you know this it's is kind of America moving on a Bitcoin standard in a way, yeah. it seems like. Um, well, I think, and that's what I really hope for, that, that they never get to the stage where they want to try and grab it. We just migrate to a Bitcoin standard. Everyone starts denominating things in SATs. Companies start paying their bills in sats. They use stable coins. The stable coins, you know, um, they use their cash to buy treasuries, which keeps the government solvent. I mean, there's there's potentially a very positive win-win here. And I'm not, I'm not ruling that out as one of the potential outcomes. I think the issue that we just don't know how it's going to unfold is, is, you know, how these things will take place in terms of adoption and, you know, all the moving pieces. There are a lot of moving pieces here. I think... I mean, I, I'm starting to get the notion that these things are going to exist side by side, these two monetary systems. But right. Bitcoin is going to continue to speculative attack this system in new and unfound ways. Right. Uh, and from on, just angles that cannot be protected against. And yes. so the, the next one I'm kind of looking at is is micro strategy, right? Because Wall yeah. Street's not going away and since stocks are not going away, bonds are not going away. Oh. 
But I think Bitcoin is just going to eat these systems alive. So I think the ETF is going to be a vehicle for Bitcoin to eat Wall Street. I agree. And I think what Michael Saylor's doing, and I want your opinion on what Michael Strateg Micro Strategy is doing, because uh, you know some people are saying this is you know uh, worth more than it should be as a stock compared to its assets, and some people are saying you know this could be worth a lot more than it is now. Yeah. So, well, first of all, I love Saylor. I love everything he's done for the space. I love his conviction. I think he's brilliant. And just his, you know, his overall value add in the space has been stunning. Um, I also love MicroStrategy and I love the stock. Um, and I think, you know, is the stock fairly valued? I mean, I think everyone has to make their own decision on that. I mean, we all know that it trades at a premium to the Bitcoin he holds. I mean, if you just take the market cap divided by the Bitcoin he holds, well, it's, we're, you know, we're giving a premium for kind of quote unquote, sailor management. But frankly, in my opinion, a premium is deserved. I mean, he's he's demonstrated the ability to finance this thing cheaply in fiat land and to use that cheap fiat fiat financing to buy the soundest money in the world. And so so it's I mean, it's it's brilliant. I think it'll be written about in the business school books for years. I think I think, you know, it's only a matter of time until other companies get smart and copy him. And, um, you know, it, it's it, it deserves a premium now. What is that premium? What should that premium be? I don't know. I mean, nobody knows, right? And obviously, there are there are people on Wall Street right now who are betting against him, and they're buying Bitcoin and shorting his stock, saying the premium is too big. Well, be careful. I mean, you know, people thought the premium was too big in Tesla before Tesla, you know, doubled and tripled again. So, I mean, it's you know, in these in these kinds of situations, you just don't know what the right what the right premium is. Um, you know, so. But I, I think MicroStrategy is a great company. The other thing he's doing that I think is underreported, but I think could ultimately be quite meaningful, is he's making a real push into the entire Lightning area and the Lightning network. He's running a developers conference in Las Vegas, and he's really trying to not just push the store of value digital property case, which he makes all the time, and which is really the, the first and best use case, in my opinion. This is a it is digital. It's scarce digital property. It's it's incredibly clean and pristine collateral. It's easy to move, easy to verify, easy to trace, and you know with a with a fixed schedule of issuance. So you know that's the best use case. Full stop. But you know there are other use cases emerging, and you know the the Lightning Network I think is is probably one of the most important ones, which is to say that you know, if it becomes the case that this is also extremely easy and cheap to transact in, I mean, right now, 10 minutes is a long time to settle and, and you know, fees, as we all know, you know, they vary and they can be quite low, but, they, you know, you're never going to buy your coffee on chain, um, you know, um, so it, it's going to take, it's going to take some time. But I, I do think, you know, I think the fact that, that Sailor is committed to building businesses in the lightning space speaks volumes about him, speaks volumes about the adoption, and is very promising and a reason to buy the MicroStrategy stock. So, um, you know, I personally am not as nearly as heavy. I own some MicroStrategy, not a, not a lot compared to the Bitcoin I own. Um, you know, I, I view Bitcoin as just the, you know, what I love about Bitcoin is I've been a stock investor my entire life. And I'll tell you, the hardest thing about investing in stocks, I mean, you can find a good company, you find a good idea, you find the right time in the right place. And I got to tell you, management can screw it up more often than you ever imagined. <laughs> they really can. And, um, you know, there, there is management in the case of Bitcoin, but it's the core developers and it's the nodes who have to vote. And so it's pretty stable now, in my opinion. There was a time when it wasn't stable, but it is now. And so I, I you know, what I love about Bitcoin is, I, you know, this programmatic issuance schedule. I just don't think there's a high probability of it getting effed up. I, I think it's a low probability. And so to me... It's just a really, really asymmetric bet as this 300 trillion of fiat wealth says, huh, I'm getting debased. I need something that can't be printed. Maybe I should buy some Bitcoin. You know, so there will be, as we know, El Salvador has taken a position. They've made it legal tender and they've also started to put it on their balance sheet. That's the first nation state to do so. I think there might be another two or three nation states doing it quietly. They may not have announced it because they don't want to compete with others. They want to try and accumulate what they can get before the price goes higher. Um, but I think there will be other nation states. And I don't think MicroStrategy will be the last company to say, hey, we've got excess cash. We're going to use it to purchase Bitcoin. 
I mean, I think, I think again, you know, everything gets measured by performance. Corporate treasuries get measured by performance. If, you know, rather than holding cash, paying a 5% coupon on, you know, rolling over four month, four week treasury bills, you can buy a Bitcoin and have it go up on average, you know, 60, 70% a year, which it's done, um, you know, admittedly volatile, but, um, you know, you should be doing it. And, and I think more people will do it. Yeah, I agree with him. You said what I find so fascinating about, about what Michael Saylor is doing is he's, you know, one, he, he had a problem and he found a solution to it. And now he's using that tool and looking everywhere he can and using it like a bazooka. So he's putting exactly. the company on lightning and coming up with innovative things that you could do on yeah. lightning. And, and yeah. I'd love to do a whole show on that. Yeah. Exactly. But what, what I saw him recently, uh, I was at some conference and he was speaking and he was answering questions, mostly from answering from high net worth individuals. And they, should we buy MicroStrategy instead of Bitcoin? And his answer was so humbling. It was, I want to paraphrase here. And he, you know, when he gets three minutes long, that's a lot of information, but, you know, just sort of off the cuff, uh, you know, him and MicroStrategy will not be here for a thousand years. MicroStrategy is not a protocol. You yeah. should go buy Bitcoin, learn about Bitcoin and invest and save in Bitcoin, right? Yeah. And he said, also, the people investing in MicroStrategy are sophisticated investors for the most part. And he's not referring to retail. He's talking about the people who buy convertible bonds, right? They have a right. mandate to go buy convertible bonds from public companies. And he's right. offering them the best deal for their mandate. And so they can't go buy the ATF and they can't go self custody Bitcoin and they're not going to give their that money back to their customers. Right. So he's not saying you go buy micro strategy. It doesn't necessarily make sense for you. I think it's great for people who are involved in it, maybe have money trapped in their 401ks or these investment vehicles were got in earlier. Maybe you have a lot of faith in it now. But what I do, you know, I am getting excited about it cuz he's literally destroying Wall Street with their own weapons and sec yes. securitizing <laughs> it against them and then using it as a spec attack. And there's nothing illegal or wrong about it. And it makes no. them happy, right? And yeah. it's it's this, this positive like flywheel. And yes. so I've been following this guy, Punter Jeff. I know he was just on Preston Pish's show, but he put up this tweet and it's like simple. Uh, he's responding to someone, but you know, because MicroStrategy are a public traded company, not an ETF, all companies trade at multiples of their assets. MicroStrategy at 2.5 multiples, one of the smallest in the world. And this data is, data is obviously dated, but like Microsoft trades at like 13.8 of its uh, you know net asset values. Apple's at 35.8, NVIDIA's at 70.2. So it's not unusual for companies to get a premium on their assets or to be valued you know, at a multiple of them. And so in those, looking at it that way, I mean, you could say MicroStrategy is undervalued maybe compared to its peers and the way it's holding its assets. And I think he's turning this into sort of a Berkshire Hathaway where he's I, just I, gonna I accumulate value. Yeah. Um, and then buy things and, and be the capital allocator of the future. Uh, what I'm, I'm curious too, I wonder if he's going to do a stock split or just let the price grow and become a very, you know, sort of Berkshire, like the price becomes the signal uh, yeah, of right. how big it's gotten. And you you have sort of, you limit your investors to make it a scarce sort of asset and right. uh, a sort of a, a something like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer on the split. I mean, on, to your earlier point that these other companies trade higher multiples of their assets, that's true, but they're not exactly an apple to his orange. And the mm -hmm. reason for that is they actually have higher operating income mm -hmm. than he has. I mean, he's not, he's got, you know, he's got these Bitcoin, but they're not really providing him with any kind of a yield. And right. these other companies have, have but maybe appreciation. Yeah. Well, exactly. He is providing and, and with when the multiples that's go on sure. that, it gets interesting. Yeah, no, no, that's true. It's all true. Look, I agree with you. What I love about him, I mean, it was amazing to me if, if you paid attention. I'm sure you have uh, recently just how how he, you know, he came out. Didn't he come out with like a 500 million dollar convert, and then a week later he came out with an 800 million dollar convert. I mean, he's just like he's like, hey, you guys want to buy this stuff? Fine. Here's more. You know, I mean, if you you know if you want to buy convert bonds in my company. And allow me to take that and put it into Bitcoin. I'm going to do it because you know it, it's there's a guy, a famous guy named Hugo Stinnes, who did this in Weimar Germany in the 20s, right? He he could see what was going on. He knew the currency was getting destroyed, and he very intelligently went out and borrowed as much as he could in this bad currency, kind of what Sailor's doing. He's borrowing in dollars, and then he took that what he borrowed and he used it to buy real assets: coal, steel industry productive productive factories etc and of course then when the collapse of the currency occurred he could pay all the people he owed money back with that currency because it was now very low valued or worthless and yet he still owned the coal and the steel and the factories and 
he became one of the richest men in the world as a result of the strategy, the Hugo Stennis, you know, leverage strategy where you sell the bad money and you buy solid good money things, money good assets. And and really, that's really what Sailor is doing here. And it's amazing to me. I mean, I, the story is kind of amazing. It's not that far back. I mean, I think MicroStrategy today has a market cap. In fact, here I can tell you if I look at my screen. I think MicroStrategy has a market cap in the 20 some odd billion area. Um, yeah, 25. I've got MicroStrategy at $25 billion market cap. Not that long ago, Cedric, this was a couple billion dollar company market cap. Not that long ago. I mean, it's, you know, and, and he went to his board and he said, hey, guys, you know, I, I figured this thing out. I think this is very real. You know, we need to get very serious about taking a position in this in this sounder form of money. Pardon me for just one second. I'm just going to let my dog out. We need to get very serious about taking a position in this um, this form of currency. And and they did. And, you know, look at the look at the transformation that's taken place. It's just been stunning. Yeah, I mean, I think. They not it wasn't too long ago they made fifty million a year in net income. Is that right? And it yeah. takes two thousand people that he has to push around the world, and they have to give up a lot of their free time and family time, and to sure. make that sweat equity. Right. And and you know Bitcoin goes up a thousand dollars now. I think he's up two hundred fifty million or two hundred five million on just that print alone, right? Which is like three times net earn income. And then what he's done to the balance sheet. I mean, even if it drew down 50% to just the Bitcoin value. That's yeah. like a 4X on where they were right. and adding like 20 years of net income to the reserves. Right. No, it's, I mean, this it's, is, it's, it's, it's a, it's a case of financial engineering that will be remembered in the history books. How really is, is, how is the rest of the street? How, how are not other public CFOs, CEOs, <laughs> not modeling yeah. this playbook to some, even a smaller extent. I you mean, know? I, I'm with shareholders you. are going to sue. <laughs> I, I'm with you. I mean, I'm kind of stunned that nobody else has figured it out. I mean, maybe some some firms quietly have figured it out. We don't know about it yet. I work in the, some of the biggest firms in America. I, I get why the you know the the bureaucracy and the political right. risk and you yeah. know the career risk and and just you know Michael Sale had a lot of control over MicroStrategy, but he's laid the blueprint. He's been very public Absolutely. about it. And, and he could take a stiff, a fifty percent drawdown and still be. It's just, it's just unreal. And I, I think I he's going to spin this to more multiples before people catch up or catch yeah, on. I, I agree with you. Well, and I look, and I wh where I think the price of Bitcoin is going. I mean, I it doesn't. I mean, it takes a couple million dollars a coin, but I mean, he ends up the richest man in the world here, as you know, it's what you and I see unfolding right. occurs. Um, he, which ends I think, up is what he's going for. Yeah, and I, I and I think he will be. I mean, I, right. I think I think there's no doubt that he will be. Um, you know, and I my view is I actually view that as a positive thing because I you know, and I could be wrong about this. My read on him is actually a very good human being, and um, and if he were the richest man in the world, he would do what he could to make the world a better place. Do you think uh, the top fifty are looking over their shoulder yet? <laughs> I don't know. That's a great question. Uh, maybe a couple of them are. I, I think in general, though, the, what I found with a lot of these people who've been incredibly successful and made a lot of money is they don't tend to be humble. They kind of believe they deserved it and they believe their own mm -hmm. bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are probably a few of them who are super smart and are, you know, thinking to themselves, wow, this look at this guy coming out of nowhere. Look at where he's gone, and how quickly he's done it. And if they're smart, they're they're looking over their shoulder. But um, I think a lot of them are probably, you know, fat, dumb, and happy. That, I mean, just do the math. They could say, hey, if he does a whatever X, he's going to catch me. Yeah. If I buy a Y, he can never catch me, a small Y. Yeah. You know, or let's call it an A or B to be a more logical order, right? Like a smaller mm -hmm. letter here and a much smaller amount, and then they would never be able to catch. And right. And I'm sure he's sitting there going like, I hope we get to, uh, you know, Z before they catch on. And exactly. then uh, they'll never be able to catch me. I think that's right. And scale that's in. Exactly. I mean, this is a game of brinksmanship in a lot of ways. Oh, it really is. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of game theory here. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of game theory, and that's um, and the same. You know, this applies at the nation state level too. I mean, um, yeah. I think you know. Sadly, I think a lot of these these foreign governments. I mean, they just don't see, and our government just don't see it. I mean, I, know J I think Jason Lowry has done everything he can to get our government to see it. My partner who had a conversation with him at a private event, 
you know, said, he said, he told my partner that, hey, you know, CIA and the Pentagon kind of get it. I mean, they understand this is an important strategic asset. Um, but sadly, I mean, you know, Congress, the Senate, the Fed, the banks, I mean, all those people view it as a threat. They all, you know, they, they, rather than say, let's get on board with this. I mean, you know, the, if the United States were to adopt it massively right now at the federal government level, it would give us such a leg up over every other country in the world that we would be unbeatable. We could recover from our debt crisis. We would recover from all kinds of things. And yet, you know, if I look at Washington, D.C., the way it's constituted, the way the people are, you know, the, the Biden administration, the way Elizabeth Warren is driving crypto policy within the Biden administration, I say to myself, sadly, the odds of that happening seem to be rather small. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, that, we're going to get to that in a second. So okay. first I'll ask, uh, you know, in this environment, we're just looking at Bitcoin. Does macro even matter? Does any of this... <laughs> You know, whether rates go up and down, tighten or not, like. It's funny you should mention that. I mean, I mean, I'm coming to I'm coming to believe more and more. It's really funny you should mention that because that that thought has been bouncing around in my mind now for six months or a year. It, it, you know, these these little we kind of know what the big macro trends are. And um, this is more important than all of them. And the adoption curve is clearly there. And, you know, arguably the macro doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I think it does matter in the sense though, that, you know, they do set the policies and, um, you know, there's a, they could theoretically try to pull us back from the brink by cutting spending and balancing the budget, um, reducing debt or having a high rate of inflation or doing a monetary reset. I mean, any one of these things could fix the problem or start to address the problem and fix the problem. But as I think you would agree with me that, you know, you don't see anything. I don't, I don't see anything to indicate that there's anyone in Washington, DC who understands that. <laughs> right. But, yeah. but I, but I, but I share your view that, I mean, it, in a sense, it's one of the beauties of Bitcoin. It's why I think you can, buy it and really relax knowing that you're on the right side of history and that you and your family are going to be quite financially secure, perhaps not rich, but just secure um, in that, you know, it's, it's kind of the, the, what I've described is, is pretty much inevitable. And so, you know, um, you could be an artist, you could be, you know, you could, you could, you can buy this saved, this asset and hodl it. And the only mistake you can make is to sell it. And if you do that, you know, you you know that your wealth is going to go up over time at some very high rate, which when you start to compound it, you know, more or less pretty quickly puts you in a situation where, you know, you're not going to have to worry too much about money anymore. I mean, I, I know people who bought a lot of coins early at lower prices and you get to be, you know, um, you've got a pretty, pretty good gain in it. And I mean, it goes up every year. I mean, the, my plan, just so you know, is you know, at some point in time, I won't have a business at some point in time, I won't have current income. And, you know, what I intend to do, I'll, I'll probably sell 3% of my Bitcoin every year, which is kind of the old standard for an annuity, you know, it, it, Bitcoin doesn't pay a yield, but you can sell it. And if I can live off of 3% of the value of my Bitcoin every year, the other 97%, I think will go up enough to replace the three plus inflation. And, you know, I, I don't run the risk of, quote unquote, running out of money when I'm 90 and can't work anymore. Right. You know, so um, to, to my way of seeing it, you know, and, and that's the way it should be, by the way. I mean, you should. I think one of the great tragedies of the situation we're in, the, the system as we've now got it, is that nobody can really safely retire. I mean, I saw a guy on Twitter the other day was talking about, you know, he's, I don't know, 70 some odd years old. He's got a couple million dollars of savings, which, you know, let's not, let's face it, that's that's real savings. Um, he's got his social security, probably 50 grand a year or whatever it might be. Um, he has, he lives simply, his house is paid for, and he feels like he can't retire because he doesn't know, mm -hmm. he, he might live to be 95 and he doesn't know how far the two million is going to take him. You know, if, if right. we have enough inflation, enough monetary debasement, you know, gasoline is $50 yeah. a gallon. Well, it's going to be hard to live off a couple of, right. you know what I mean? And you want so, to live off it and maybe help your, your next generation maybe. Exactly. And be there for and them. So, so and to me, that's, so... One of the, it's one of the great tragedies of fiat, you know, the fiat debasement game. And, and it's one of the things that, that, that Bitcoin solves. It, it really does solve it. It allows you to know 
that nobody's going to steal your savings. You know, and that that I mean that's that's powerful. That's very very yeah. powerful. I've also yeah. seen studies where you could probably spend ten percent of your Bitcoin per year. Oh, I think and, that's right. You know, I'm, I'm being very yeah. conservative. At yeah, 3%. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, mean, I just I don't think um, there's any way spending three percent of your Bitcoin a year you run out of money because right. I just think the balance goes up enough to cover. Right. It. Yep. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I agree with you. We're going to be on the right side of history, and you know, this is inevitable. Uh, thinking adversarial again. I mean, there might be another China mining ban or some sort of event oh, that yeah. throws Bitcoin back or off schedule or whatever you want to call that. Uh, along those lines, does, does the having matter? I think it does. I mean, only because I'm looking at it historically. I mean, I tend to, in, in investing, I think one of the important skills to have is kind of pattern recognition. You know, what, um, and, you know, because patterns do tend to recur in, in a lot of different things, including financial assets. And if you look historically, you know, the reduction of the supply by half um, tends to have a pretty positive impact on price. Yeah, kind of 12 months after, you know, the halving takes place. I mean, that just as an average, it varies in each cycle. And so, you know, and, and as Sailor pointed out in the <laughs> stage on Madeira, you know, by, 19, by 2034, that's 10 years from now, 99% of all the Bitcoin that's ever going to be produced will have been mined. Only 1% will remain. So the stock to flow, there'll almost be no flow. That last 1%, you know, because we're shrinking the supply or the, the reward asymptotically, that last 1% takes 100 years. And 100 years from then, there'll be no more supply. We'll, every coin will have been mined. Um, you know, taking this, I mean, it's. I, I think the having is is becoming less important than it was in the past. Because, you know, when, when they were giving out 50 coins in the first cycle, that was a lot. You know, every 10 minutes, that was a big, big supply. You know, we're now at six and change and we're going to three and change. And so, um, yeah, it, it, you know, the, the, the reduction in supply, I think, will have a positive impact on the price. It always has in the past. And it's tended to lead to, you know, generally kind of a ramp because the, it is a FOMO asset. And I think we're entering that zone right now where, you know, we just surpassed the last all-time high, but only barely. And so we're kind of bouncing around in the 65 to 70 something area. And I think soon we'll exit that area. And, you know, when we go through 80, 90, 100, my guess is real FOMO will kick in. There'll be a lot of people saying to themselves, oh shit, you know, this thing's moving, I, I'm, I'm missing it. And, you know, I could see us very quickly shooting up to 200, um, maybe higher. Some people say much higher. I don't know. But at some point, everyone will get too far out over their skis. Some people will be levered. They'll have bought it on leverage. So, you know, it'll start to come down. They'll panic. And some some weak hands will dump it. I mean, the one thing that's true about these ETFs, it's good because it brings demand in. Um, but, you know, it's not all hodler demand. It's not like you and me. They're not necessarily, some of them are buying it. I think I'm going to put this away for five or 10 years. You know, as as, um, as it was pointed out to me by the sailor on the stage of Madeira, you know, some people are going to get a two, a two or a three bagger in it. And like, this is great. I've tripled my money. I'm out of here. I'm selling it, you know. Um, and that'll be the wrong thing to do. But and they'll have won. They'll have made some money. But, you know, they, they won't really they don't really understand what they have. And, you know, there are very, very few financial assets that compound continuously over long, long periods of time. They tend to be things like Microsoft. They tend to be, you know, they tend to be core things that are part of a system that will not be replaced and that almost represent like a monopoly, you know, and, and examples would be kind of the internet or Amazon or Microsoft or, you know, Google or whatever it might be. And, and this is one of them, in my opinion. And so, you know, you really, you don't sell it. I mean, obviously if you need cash and you, you need to dissave, of course, of course you sell it at, at that point in time, you just say, but in general, compared to other investments, you know, there are other investments that I'm involved with where, you know, I kind of, I think there's a ceiling on how far they can go. And it's like, okay, I invest in something and I think it'll grow to this size. And at that point in time, the market's pretty fully saturated and, you know, there, there are probably better opportunities somewhere else. And so I will sell them and I'll move on. But I, this is this is unique in that way. I don't think this is. I don't think that's the case here. I think you can. I think this thing will be higher in five years. I think it'll be higher in ten years. I think it'll be higher still in twenty years. And so, you know, now if you need capital to live your life, I mean, there's no point in being ninety years old, being super rich, and having never done anything. I mean, you know, we all have wives, we have kids, we have houses. People want to take vacations. Experiences are priceless. I mean, you know, people say people talk about wealth. I mean, to me, wealth is being healthy and having time. You know, I'm sure Warren Buffett would trade 
all the billions he has in exchange for another 50 years. You know, he's a very wealthy man, but sadly, he's almost out of time. And, um, you know, you can't take it with you. So um, people say, well, why would you ever sell Bitcoin? Well, I'll tell you why you'd sell Bitcoin. I'd sell Bitcoin to help my kids. I'd sell Bitcoin to take have great experiences with my family. I'd sell Bitcoin to do something charitable that I want to do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for for, the, for all the reasons anybody spends money on anything. I mean, but but to the degree you have savings, I think this is without a doubt the best savings vehicle I have ever seen. Um, it's just it's very unique, and 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 in a sense, I don't think people appreciate just how lucky we are to have this thing and and to you know to to be, and if you're aware of it, to be aware of it. I mean, I think there. are Sadly, there are a lot of people who, if they were aware of it, they'd, they'd get it, but they're not even aware of it. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, you doing podcasts, me being involved with it, you know, others listening. Um, I, you know, I think we're actually quite lucky um, to be where we are at this time. Yeah, I mean, I went back to, I think, a speech you gave in 2021 or 2020. It was a gold conference, a gold yeah. Bitcoin speech and a tremendous speech. People should check that out. It's only about 12 minutes long. Fantastic. And you referenced Bitcoin there as a you know the biggest asymmetric trade you know in history, uh, which I, which I agree with. I think it's a once in a species event. Right. Um, but I want to ask you, you know, uh, this year. I mean, do you do you think politics and this election coming up in the fall are going to affect Bitcoin in any way? We, we you know we kind of ruminating in the last six months thinking about how maybe macro doesn't affect Bitcoin. Does politics affect Bitcoin? Does it? Uh, you know, great there's question. a difference I, between these guys for Bitcoin. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think it's interesting. They've all evolved a little bit. You know, Trump used to hate it, and I think Vivek got to him. Now he doesn't hate it quite so much. I mean, they're all starting to realize that there is a, a voting block out here. Um, RFK seems the most friendly towards it. Vivek does too. Um, you know, and Vivek's out. He's out now. But um, you know. I, I kind of share your view. I'm not, I'm not sure it really does affect it. I mean, I think, I mean, obviously, you know, if Elizabeth Warren won and tried to ban it or tax it, that would have an impact. I mean, I, you know, I don't think anyone wants to go to jail or pay 90% tax on it, but fortunately she's not running for president. And I don't, fortunately, I don't think she can really control things at the end of the day. Um, you know, I don't know, Cedric, it's interesting. I, this is part of my Zen state for having mm -hmm. found this and gotten into it. I don't even pay attention to politics anymore. I just find it all so wasteful and dysfunctional and stupid. And that I just, it's kind of like when somebody wants to talk to me about blue red or this, that, I mean, I'm just like, you know, save it. I, I don't want to hear it. You know, uh, the only thing I really care about is sound money. And um, <laughs> this is the soundest form of money we've ever had. And so, you know, if you want me to talk about Bitcoin, I'll talk your ear off all night long and I'll try and convince you why you should buy it and why you should convince everybody you know to buy it. Uh, because I think that makes a real political statement. And I think ultimately, if the world is run by Bitcoiners, it'll be a much better world. But, um, you know, and, and, and look, we need politics. I mean, I, in my view, there is a role for the federal government and it is to be the referee. I mean, we need we need courts. We need people to put bad people in jail. Um, but beyond that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a federal government minimalist and, uh, I think all the things they've gotten themselves into are just ridiculous. I mean, they should be guarding the borders and, um, putting criminals in jail. Um, all the rest is to me wasteful. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think politics are life, but I like what Bitcoin has done for me and give me the Zen mindset, especially at the national level, because we're so far removed from Washington DC geographically and, I yeah. feel, you know, it, none of it's really great for us. It's kind of lesser of evils. But, you know, one of, I, I did see something that was very interesting recently, and I want to know your opinion on it. Uh, what did you think, especially as a gold bug, what did you yeah. think of President Bukele uh, publishing El Salvador's proof of reserves, you know, their Bitcoin address? I thought it was great. I mean, talk about transparency, right? You know, and I, I'm, by the way, I would hope and think that, that the ETFs should do the same thing. I doubt they will. But I think they should. Um, you know, look, we live in a transparent world. And, and as you mentioned, as I am a gold bug, and I can tell you for sure that I don't think we have the gold we say we have in Fort Knox. And I know for, you know, at least I believe, I should say for a fact, that, you know, the gold price has been heavily suppressed by governments. 
in an effort to defend the fiat currencies. And that's one of the problems with gold is you can't verify it. You know, and so somebody can say they have it and they don't. Um, and people can issue paper gold certificates that aren't backed by the real thing. And there are many of us who think that there are 100 claims on every ounce of gold that exists in the world because people have bought paper gold that, you know, if, if one day everyone would wake up who owns paper gold and say, give me the gold itself, there wouldn't be enough to go around. It's a big game of musical chairs. Um, by the way, I, I should add that, you know, there is some risk of that in the Bitcoin world in the sense that futures and derivatives on Bitcoin are dangerous things. Um, I personally think they should be outlawed and banned. Um, but we know there is quote unquote paper Bitcoin. I mean, a perfect example is Sam Bankman Freed, uh, when they when FTX went back bankrupt, they found that they had customers who had Bitcoin accounts or thought they owned Bitcoin at FTX, and yet FTX had not purchased any coins. <laughs> so so they had sold their clients Bitcoin, taken money, said, Okay, yeah, I'll take your money and I'll I'll give you an account that says you own one Bitcoin, but they didn't go to the chain and buy it. That's paper Bitcoin. That's fake Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, FTX did it. Is anyone else doing it? I don't know. I, I, I don't think the ETFs are doing it, but it's not impossible that there aren't people who are cheating, you know? Yeah, so. for sure. Um, Paul Tarantino uh, put this question on Twitter. This was really interesting. If, if, if the Treasury repriced gold to like 10000 per ounce in order to reset its debt to GDP... How does that impact Bitcoin adoption, maybe short and long term? It's a great question, Paul. Um, look, I mean, it. I think that I think that there's a chance that the monetary system is broken, and arguably the monetary system is failing. And the central banks. I mean, one of the reasons why gold is at record highs is not because there's ETF demand. If you look at the GLD ETF, it's actually been dissaved. People have been selling GLD. I actually think to probably to buy Bitcoin. Um, but the, but there's been a, the record high prices in gold because other countries, the rest of the world, who is not caught on to Bitcoin, perceives gold as being the best form of sound money. And so you've seen enormous demand for gold out of the Arab states, out of China, out of the Middle East, et cetera. And so, um, you know, I think if we do a monetary reset, there's some chance that people try to do that using gold because it's the old form of sound money. I don't think that's the ideal thing to do, but I think it's a possible event. Um, Paul, you're right. I mean, they could. They, we own a bunch of gold in theory. I, I frankly hmm. think we don't have it. Ron Paul told me he doesn't think we have it, but let's assume we do have it. Um, the Treasury could reprice gold and say we're bringing all this gold onto our balance sheet, and we're going to reduce, you know, use that to reduce our debt. Um, and you know that that is a possibility. It, it would probably be somewhat negative for Bitcoin at the time. Um, and obviously it'd be very positive for gold because the price at which it was would be necessary to do that would be much higher than the $2,200 a share. I mean, it would be more than $10,000, Paul. It'd be $20,000, $30,000, $40,000 an ounce right. of gold. Right. Um, and so so if that, you know, if you got that, that's a, that means that, you know, maybe gold looks a little better compared to Bitcoin at that point in time. But I think that soon thereafter, you'd run into all the problems you've run in with gold, you know, which is the verifiability, the difficulty in transfer, the difficulty in proving that it's not fake, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so I think ultimately, um, absent them pushing gold down our throats, what we're going to evolve to is what you and I have kind of talked about, which is a, a two-tier system with Bitcoin and the dollar. And I think just over time, what will happen is the dollar will just fade away. And people will start quoting things in sats, uh, particularly if if it becomes much easier to transact in sats. And that's the Lightning Network, right? I mean, right now, to try to run all the transactions we're running in the world on Bitcoin would be a disaster. I mean, it's just not ready for it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, you know, a block every 10 minutes, a fixed size, you know, a couple thousand transactions. I mean, good Lord, we've got billions of financial transactions occurring every second. And, um, you know, we've got to have the system has to be able to do that. Um, and we've evolved a complex, you know, system with MasterCard Visa and all these others that do do that. Um, and, you know, can the Lightning Network get there and handle that? Sure. But not tomorrow. You know, it's going to take years. Um, so, you know, and that, that will develop over time, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to talk or hear a little bit about what you talked about in Madeira with, with the end point and the end game. Yeah. Um, so 
I just believe that, I mean, I can see and I really sincerely believe that this being a better form of money, it will just continue to get adopted by more and more and more people. And ultimately, we will transact in sats. And, you know, I, I think Bitcoin will go to 500,000 a coin and then a million a coin and then 2 million and then 4 million and then 8 million. And I'm not sure where it'll settle out in terms of the balance of how much fiat there is. I mean, pretty soon it won't really matter measuring it in dollars anymore because there won't be people really using dollars. We'll start pricing things in sats. And so, um, and, you know, to the degree a sat gets too expensive, we could do micro sats. You can start splitting your sats up. So, um, you know, I, to me, and I think to Sailor and others as well, it, it's the logical endpoint of where we go. I don't know that we know the slope of the curve. Could that be 50 years from now, 40 years from now, 30 years from now, 20 years from now? I don't know. I tend to kind of think it's probably 20, 25 years from now, maybe a little more. Um, I think that's where we're going. Now, it's interesting because, you know, Sailor says, and, and I, I watched his language very carefully, and I watched a lot of people in the Bitcoin space, including Jeff Booth and others. And, you know, I've always kind of warned about the dangers of hyperinflation. I still think there's a tail event possibility of that. But I've noticed a lot of the people who are big influence in Bitcoin, they know we're winning and they don't want to scare people. They want to try and maintain a positive message. And I agree with that. And so they say, hey, you know, knock off the hyperinflation stuff. Let's just let the evolution occur naturally. Um, and this is why, you know, Sailor in particular, if you've noticed his, his messaging and his languaging re language recently, I mean, I think he knows where we're going. I think he knows that someday we will be on a SAT standard worldwide. I'm, I'm sure he believes that. He's too smart not to understand that and get that. But if you've noticed, he's saying out loud that, you know, this is digital property. He's not saying it's digital currency. And the reason I think he says that is he's thinking to himself, there's no way I want to take a pick a fight with the U.S. government, the U.S. Treasury, the Federal Reserve, the Congress, the Senate, all those guys. I mean, I don't need to destroy the dollar to have Bitcoin work. I just need to have Bitcoin work as, as, as a sound form of digital property. And then the dollar will do whatever the dollar will do. And that's not something I'm not out to kill the dollar. I'm just out to prove that owning Bitcoin is like owning Manhattan real estate in 1600 or 1700. It's a great form of rare digital property. And it's going to go up in value for a long, long, long time. Could it live in a parallel world with the dollar? Very possibly. But, you know, I think if the if the powers that be continue to behave in the fashion they behaved with respect to the dollar, then I think it's um, it's not realistic to think that it, ultimately the dollar might, you know, not be around and it, it, we'll just be doing things in sats. And that's that's how I see it analytically. And, th and that's not, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just trying to kind of, realistically predict what's what you know what the what the trends suggest to you might happen i mean the other thing i loved what sailor said was that you know we're entering the bitcoin gold rush yeah right yeah and the way he defined it and i like two things he defined one sort of the time period that the next 10 years and that was a really great marker for people to realize that like you can buy a dollar a day for the next 10 years right you could start buying in a year from now eight years from now you're not going to be late you're still gonna be in this right. early window. And the way he came up with the windows that we go from like 98%, you know, Bitcoin emitted out uh, algorithmically to the, to the last night, so 1%. So that 99% would be emitted in November of 2024, or October of 2024, uh, 34. Right. And, you know, I, I, I see, you know, I think we both see, you know, the opportunity maybe, or, you know, the fear of a social revolution or a fourth turning. But, you know, I do think we're both optimistic. A lot of reasons to be optimistic. I think Sailor and Jeff Booth, like you were saying, see where this is going. We're going to get through all that. You know, maybe the price of gas gets crazy when Bitcoin is a million dollars. Um, but I want to, I want a couple more questions before we round out here. A little bit on the personal side. So, do you think uh, sound money is a moral issue? I really do. I, I've, I've thought that for a long time, and I think a lot of the, a lot of the problems in our society stem from the the unsound monetary system that we have and it was never look it's never been perfectly sound because there was never perfectly sound money but i will say this gold was sounder as a form of money than fiat um and i think you can definitely track a, a denigration in 
a lot of the um, morals of society post going off the gold standard in 1971. Um, it started before that. I mean, but that that to me is a, is a really important demarcation point. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, if you, you know, what is it Ron Paul says, gold is disliked by, you know, gold is honest money and that's why it's disliked by dishonest men. I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the system we've got, the fiat system we've got, where a certain group of people control the money, i.e. the Federal Reserve, the banks, and the governments, and, and they control it to their own favor, such that they can get rich at the expense of the rest of us. I mean, as, as Jeff Booth points out, this is, a, this is an unlevel playing field where, you know, heads they win, tails we lose. And... Um, you know, the, 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 we've had, if you think about what we've done in the last 40 years, we've had enormous technological innovation, enormous productivity gains as a result of the microchip, the computer, communications, the internet, all the stuff we're using today. I mean, good God, it's made the world so much better than it was in the 70s. We all should be working 30 hour work weeks and have, you know, a lot of money. And yet the, the, a lot of that benefit has been siphoned off by the top 1%. And we can see this in the, in the wealth inequality. And to me, the reason that's occurred, the way the way that's occurred is that top 1% has, has, has figured out, their continuers, they figured out that if they can buy, if they can get the money for free or cheap, as they did with ZERP and all the other policies they had, they can use it to buy assets and raise the prices for the rest of us. And so it's just kind of classic monopolistic behavior on the part of the elites and the rich people. And yeah, that's, to me, that's extremely immoral. I mean, we've had you know, if you look at the suicides, you look at the deaths of despair mm -hmm. in the United States, in the Midwest, you look at the way we offshored all our manufacturing industries to China. You look at the fact that we engaged in all these wars that we really couldn't afford, but that inflation allowed us to afford because we printed the money to pay for them. And, you know, we all think that, hey, you know, we didn't pay for those wars. Well, sure you did. You're paying for that war every time you buy gasoline for five dollars. You know, that's you're, you're sending money into the war machine. And so. So yes, I, I feel very, very strongly that um, that unsound money has created a lot of ills in the world. And this is why I stole this phrase from Marty Bent, who is a good friend and, and I'm you know very impressed by him. Um, you know, fix the money, fix the world. I'm not sure if he coined it, somebody coined it. But anyway, it you know, the broken money is part of the broken society. And, you know, this is why my 20-year-old kids can't afford to buy houses and you know, it's just, it's, it's, I mean, you look around, I, I know, you know, I'm, I'm 66. I grew up in the seventies. The seventies weren't perfect. We had the Vietnam war in the early part of the decade and so on and so forth. We had other issues going on, but this country was a much fairer, nicer, more balanced country in the seventies than it is today. You know, the, the people at the top weren't raping it. And, uh, and um, you know, the middle class was vibrant and you know, one one breadwinner could support a family. Uh, you didn't have to work two or three jobs, and and uh, you know, it, it, the financialization wasn't there, um, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and, and it just it was just a better world. It was a better country, and uh, in a big way. And and I I hate to see that get lost. Um, and and I want to restore that so that my kids um, live in a country that's more like that. And less like the country that we're living in right now. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think of uh, peak America, maybe because I'm 20 years younger than you, is 1990, like four to 1996, yeah, when people were still, you know, sitting around the dinner table, not arguing about politics, not arguing about yeah. religion anymore, or race, or gender, yeah. or sex, or any of these things. And it was a very optimistic atmosphere. It was also the best time in hip hop, so maybe I'm biased there too. <laughs> uh -huh. I, you know. think that's, I think that's right. I mean, I think we, I think we slowly but surely just kept going downhill, you know, in, in yeah, waves. Yeah, and maybe that yeah. had to do with that. It was the best time in hip hop. I don't know uh, <laughs> if that, you know, what the coincidence was there. You know, I, I do agree too that you know, I, th I think a Bitcoin is the only real thing that's being marked to market in real time or fair market yes. value. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you can see that with commercial real estate and that's getting marked to market very quickly and abruptly, but they're hiding it and they're stalling it. We obviously have a sovereign debt problem. Um, I, I think they're trying, you know, they're obviously trying to own, unload all their debt on us. And the only way to prevent that or to defend yourself from them doing that is 
is obviously not to buy a house at these overpriced, uh, yep. inflated prices, or not to buy stocks at the overinflated prices, but to buy Bitcoin and, and defend yourself from them being able to unload their debt on you. Um, right. and, and so I think we should be optimistic. I agree with you. Uh, I don't think we are wrong. So my final question for you, and it's a little, again, I'm a little bit more on a personal note, and Chef Quattro on Twitter, and I'll just read his tweet, he said, you know, he believes that Larry is a sober man. Maybe ask him how life changing that was and how clean, simple, sober living fits into a Bitcoin-centric lifestyle. How <laughs> alcohol can be compared to shit coins, leaving people and their families wrecked. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question, and that is true. I mean, I was... In my early to mid-30s, I was working in a fiat job with some very fiat bosses who were not nice people. I didn't like them at all. And uh, I was um, masking that pain um, by drinking. And uh, my wife identified it. I identified it. We said, you know what? Um, we got to face the facts. And uh, um, I quit drinking and I left that job. And my life got enormously better as a result of those two decisions. And uh, yeah, alcohol really is a shit coin. I kind of view it as poison. Now, you know, I, I've got a lot of friends who drink and I don't want to, you know, everyone is allowed to make their own personal choices. And I think if you can control the amount that you drink and you use it occasionally and it provides you with benefit and you enjoy it, I mean, have at it. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be, I'm not a, an abolitionist. You know, I think everybody ought to be able to make their own choice of what they put in their body. But in my case, um, it, my life improved immeasurably as a result of just, and, and some people say, well, why didn't you just stick with it and kind of go part way? Well, I'm not a partway kind of guy, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, either, I'm pretty intense and, you know, whatever I do, I'm going to do it seriously. And so I didn't, I never really kind of figured out the, how to have one or two drinks and stop. I mean, either you were drinking or you weren't. And so I just said, you know what, I'm not going to do this anymore. And I, I can say for me anyway, it made an enormous improvement in my life. And, uh, and so I highly recommend it, uh, particularly if you struggle with it a bit or you feel like it's messed up your life. I mean, it, it's really nice because, it, it makes it, the decision making becomes very easy. I mean, you're just not having any. You know, I know a lot of people who drink are like, well, did I have too much? Should I have another one? Where am I? You know, you, you get on this whole slope of slippery slope of what are you doing with it? Do you know what I mean? Well, I know what I'm doing with it. I'm just not having it <laughs> ever. <laughs> and so suddenly that whole, you know, that whole mental game of how much am I drinking? Am I drinking too much? Am I drinking too, you know, it just goes away. And, uh, you know, it also means you wake up with, you know, you wake up sober, you wake up with, you know, no headache, you know, there's no more, there's no more hangover. There's no, all the physical effects of it aren't particularly great. I mean, I've heard that maybe, you know, one red wine a day can actually be good for you physically. And perhaps that's true, but I'm willing to miss out on that. Um, so, so yeah, I, it, for me, it's worked great. And I highly recommend it to anyone who's considering doing it. But, um, you know, I, like I say, I'm not an abolitionist. I mean, if, you know, people enjoy drinking a little bit, I mean, I, you know, I've got no problem with that and they should do it. They should do whatever they want. It's, it's their life, right? Um, so, yeah. Well, did that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, thank yeah. you for for taking the time to answer it. And I really appreciate you coming back on the show, Larry. Oh, I enjoyed it very much. I, yeah, you know, I think we're very like minded on this whole uh, the developments that we're seeing here. So it's it's always fun to talk to you. Yeah, we'll have to do it again soon. Uh, definitely recap because it's going to be interesting no matter which way it goes. Oh, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, there'll be there will be lots of ups and downs and lots of developments. I mean, it's. Um, it's a thrill a minute in this game. There's, there's yeah, no I, I'm that. starting to think that this might be the last election. If there's yeah, anything, there's you know. that possibility. I mean, I you know, I mean, I we just don't know, Cedric, where all this is going to go, and we don't know, we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I I feel like at some point, I feel like the next big deal is going to be the Fed. You know, the bond market breaks, the CRE market breaks. I don't know, something happens. And we have another 2020 like event where the Fed balance sheet goes from what is it called today, seven trillion to twenty-two trillion. And the deficit goes from two trillion to four trillion. And gasoline goes to ten dollars. You know, I mean, I, I feel like the next one could be, I mean, because what's happened is these these breaks have become more frequent and they become bigger in amplitude. Mm -hmm. And so um, and at some point they're gonna get real big. And, and maybe that's going to lead to some reform, which is really kind of what we need. Right. And uh, uh, so to me, that's that's kind of what I'm watching for. And, it, you know, it could happen tomorrow. It could be three years away. I don't know. And, but it's it, it's it's definitely you feel it building. You feel it coming. You know, they cannot continue to grow the debt in the way that they're growing it 
without growing the underlying money supply. And, yeah. you know, and maybe it'll be just as simple as they'll grow the underlying money supply and the, the country will continue to, you know, to grow and do reasonably well. But we're going to live with a real period of inflation. And then eventually the inflation squawking will get large enough and or the part of the population will get large enough that will everyone will be owning Bitcoin. And, and, and that, you know, and, and that's that's the best case. And that's what I hope for is that we just peaceably transition from this dollar, which is very inflationary and very mismanaged into everybody knows that the right thing to do is to put your savings in Bitcoin. And then, you know, then what will happen is we'll have a Bitcoin economy with sats and things will be priced in sats and Bitcoiners will be, you know, better off and they'll be probably in more positions of power and, and making the government a better place. I mean, you know, I, I, I kind of detected, I, I could be wrong about this, but I get the sense that Saylor might want to run for president someday. I mean, he's going to be a yep, historical. I see that. I mean, I, I sat there and I talked to him at this, at this Madeira conference. I felt like it was like talking to Ben Franklin or something. I mean, this guy, this guy, I mean, it's just, it's stunning how fucking smart he is. It's just absolutely stunning. And, and he's on a mission. He's right. absolutely positively on a mission. And I, I think he's going to be one of the most important figures in history you know, in the next 50 years. Right. And, and and as a result of that, or in, in this time frame until he until he passes. And so as a result of that, I think the impact he's going to have on the world is going to be just enormous. And, you know, I mean, frankly, I would be very, very pleased to live in a country where Sailor was president and he was setting the strategic direction for America. I mean, right. I, you know, it'd, be a, it'd be a great country in, in that environment. Um, we're not there yet, but, uh, you know, you can dream. It, it's, right. it doesn't strike me as impossible. <laughs> It's interesting, you know, looking back at sort of uh, Microsoft, uh, you know, in 1983 with Steve Ballmer, and you can look at like Berkshire Hathaway and the price of at 1500 in 1963. And there's stories of people like, I can't buy 20 of them. I'm going to go buy something else. And, you know, it's yeah. now worth 600000 a share. It, it, I, I think we're earlier than 1995 in terms of Bitcoin compared to Microsoft. But it feels because of the ETFs like that Windows 95 moment. That was my first year in college and or my second year, I think. And you know, the computers all came at Windows 95 then. And, the, you know, they they paid for the Rolling Stones to be uh, their song, Start Me Up. And it yeah. was like really like Windows had arrived for retail. It's a little right. bit inverse because it's not the same thing. And maybe Bitcoin went to retail first and then commercial. But Microsoft, maybe the opposite. But it felt like everyone was getting a computer with Windows on. It. Everyone was talking about that their computer had yes. Windows on it. Well, and, just yeah, didn't... Yeah. and point and click, which had come out of the Mac, which, which you know, jobs developed. And. And yeah, I mean, that goes back to, we didn't really cover it as depth as we, we might have. That goes back a little bit to the discussion we were having about this is the 10-year gold rush for this stuff. I mean, I really do think this is going to pick up a lot of momentum and a lot of steam. I've seen it in my personal life. I mean, I was always the Bitcoin guy with all of my friends the last seven years. And a lot of them just, you know, thought I was nuts or couldn't care less. And, you know, they're all coming back Maybe. with kind of newfound respect. And they're asking questions and they want to understand it. Do you, you know what I mean? And so, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you're seeing the same thing. We're all seeing it. And so, yeah, we'll bet. You know, yeah, it's, for sure. It's, it's, it's going to, you know, pretty soon, I mean, this is going to be much more common knowledge. And, you know, we're going to see a larger and larger, it's just going to keep growing. Yeah. You know, just like that, that Windows 95 moment where, yeah, I mean, if you didn't have a graphic user interface on your IBM PC, I mean, you know, what the hell? You're still fucking around with DOS. I mean, that's ridiculous. Right. You know, and that's the same. I think the same thing is going to happen here. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, this has been tremendous as always. So dope. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. I know. Actually, we're going to see each other soon. soon uh, we're going to see each other uh, May well, 11th in Miami. Right? Bitcoin Day. Yeah, that that's the one on April 11th. May 11th? May, oh, no. Hang on. Oh, is that the one up in Massachusetts? My, no, oh. in Miami. No, no. Bitcoin Day, no, in Miami. Miami. I'm not going to be at that. You're not going to be at that one? I'm going to be at the one. No. I'm in Massachusetts, be in Montreal, you're going to Montreal. Right? I'm going to Montreal as well. So we'll see each other at Canadian Bitcoin Conference, May 16th right. to the 18th. Right. Okay. Right. I didn't the know you weren't Miami, going to Miami. I'm not. I'm. I'm, I'm traveling. I, I. As you can tell, I'm in Florida right now, as you are. Um, yep. We, we spent our winters here because I'm a tax refugee from Massachusetts. <laughs> but in early May, in early May, I drive back up to Boston. So. Uh, okay. Well, then I'll see you in Montreal. I'll see you in Montreal. Yeah, May that'd 16th. Great. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, like I say, I always really enjoy talking to you. Let people know where they can find you and your work. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, well, as you, as you know, probably some people do and some don't. I'm a big loudmouth on Twitter. I don't like the central banks. It's just my name, Lawrence Lepard. 
Uh, and then if you want to get my quarterly newsletter, it's free. You can go to our website. Uh, my partner, David Foley, and I run a, a couple funds. And uh, the website is EMA2, Edward Mark Elf, uh, the number two.com. Sign up for a free letter. We'll never spam you. There's all kinds of links to my interviews and all, all kinds of stuff there about the mac, our macro views. So, um, and, you know, I, like I say, I mean, I've been doing sound money since 08. And, you know, gold used to be the only form of sound money. I'm so glad Bitcoin came along because, as I think one of the clips you sent around a lot, Cedric, and I, is that, you know, I, I love these Bitcoiners, right? We got all these sharp spears we're charging up the hill and, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to bring down this fiat monster. We're going to slay it. <laughs> so it, it's a good thing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, I agree. Okay. And uh, it's been tremendous. Thank you so much. Okay. Larry. Thanks a lot. Take care. And that's what's up this week with Lawrence Lepard on the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. I hope that you found it as informative and engaging as I did. Hit us up. We'd love to hear your feedback. And thank you for tuning in. Finally, please give the Bitcoin Matrix podcast a five-star review wherever you dome your pods. That would really help me get the word out and help new listeners to find the show. Keep building, keep stacking, and always be laser-focused out there. This is Cedric Youngelman. Peace. Peace.